Yeah, there we go. Okay, so we're uh, going to conclude our study in Homer's Odyssey uh, with books 20 to 24 and the conclusion to the plot, <coughs> which began with a crisis, as I said, and uh, that plot line structure is characteristic of the epic. It deals with and brings us a, a suspenseful uh intro to the whole of the topic and deals with the problem of fundamental un injustice. And the fundamental injustice is that a just man uh, has not been rewarded by the gods for his conduct. And this creates a problem. The apparent or the apparent injustice that the, the good, the just, the righteous receive at the hands of the gods. And not only that, but they in, in this case, the, uh, it's made that much more strongly by the fact that the just man is treated with manifest injustice, abominable injustice, in fact. He is not returned home, and the, uh, in, in his absence, he's been getting eaten out of house and home by the suitors, represented here holding out their little flowers for Penelope, weaving on her loom and ignoring them, turning her back to them, etc. But, uh, and uh, not only have they been uh, wooing his wife, but his son has grown up without a father and the kingdom has fallen into disarray. Uh, manifest signs of immorality characterizes the kingdom of Ithaca of which Odysseus was the king. So all around, this is a very bad outcome for a just man and that's the beginning of the epic. And so interestingly, it seems sort of a trial by ordeal, which is how we describe the book of Job, uh, a story that's not like this in many ways, but it is a trial by ordeal. It's dealing with the problem, the problem of evil, if you want to put it abstractly. But this, this book never seems like the problem of evil, but I've submitted to you that actually, in many ways, it is dealing with the problem of evil, uh, evil as, and an injustice in that. And we see that in the epic, not only is this seen as an, a topic worthy of uh, poetic exposition, but it's worthy of the gods' attention. And so the gods were involved right from the beginning of it, and they are very interested in what's going on. And in fact, they're involved in the uh, deployment of the plot, making sure that justice is in fact done. And, and Homer at various points uh, mentions the fact that much of the injustice that men receive uh, is goes beyond what that was even fated for them by their own wickedness. They, they bring in even more injustice. In fact, in the case of um, Agamemnon, he was uh, the suitor. Agisthus was explicitly warned not to kill Agamemnon and uh, bed his wife. Do not do that. And he did it anyway. So there's a possibility in this universe uh, not to change the fates, but to make your situation worse. You can't seem to alter it altogether. We'll come to that next when, when we look at the uh, tragedy, because there we see that a man who wanted to do a good thing, nonetheless did a very bad thing while trying to avoid doing a bad thing, namely Oedipus. Here we have it rather differently. We have a very good man who has not been rewarded for the... Uh, for his good deeds and his attitude towards the gods. So you can see that already this is dealing with perennial human issues and problems that we experience in life, very real to life. And as I said, it is teaching its audience about wisdom and virtue. And I would say that the great tradition of literature uh, and the great books, the greatest books, the ones that we want to read over and over, deal with themes of wisdom and virtue. They're, they're battles between good and evil, if you will. But it's more than just good and evil in an abstract way. It's very personal. And it, here it encompasses the whole of the known world and Homer dedicates his attention to it and will the Odyssey and the Iliad will be sung in Greek culture for, for centuries and they will be instructive. People will learn how to uh, think and how to act as a result of the models that they're being given here. And it's so important that the philosophers will, and we'll come to this very shortly, will disagree with the portrait of the gods, and say the gods are unjust, like they lie. They commit immorality. They do terrible things all the time. They're just, you know, we can't hold them accountable. They're, immor they're, they're immortals. 
and they, they don't die. But otherwise, they're like really bad men. They seem motivated by jealousy and lusts and so forth, which we would condemn in men. And in fact, Odysseus shows that he's better than the gods by resisting all of his passions. And it doesn't seem like the gods can do likewise. Every time there's a nymph around, they jump on them. Like that's pretty much it. Like they, so we have intemperate gods that are ruled by their passions, and their, but we have the role model for us, who's Odysseus and Penelope, who both suffer under terrific uh, temptation of various sorts for a very long time and suffer great want of company and affection and protection, and you name it, and nonetheless endure because of their virtue. And so the, 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 the men, and I include Penelope under this, the men here that are virtuous role models are far better than the gods in their character. And that, again, that's the critique that Socrates is going to make about the Odyssey. The, you, the gods are not the way you say they are. Can't, can't be. Because they are unjust. And they're not role models for us. That can't possibly be the case. So, but, but on to this. <clears throat> I left off last time with uh, Homer, Odysseus, uh, having been reunited with his son, and um, as we saw in 19, revealed by Eurycleia, his nurse by accident. And so the, the uh, tension is building in the whole story. Is, is he going to get found out? And is he going to, how is he going to deal with the suitors? Because there are a lot of them. There's not just one. There is a whole crowd of suitors that are in the room with him. And he, although he's, his son is in on the, the knowledge of his identity, uh, and there are, so there's two of them, it's two against an army. So how on earth are they going to deal with the suitors and their injustice? And so the tension is, is building here. What, what's he going to do? But it's clear that Athena wants them to be killed. That comes from the gods. Even if you don't want to do this, I want you to do this. Because the way they have treated you is so bad that a lesson needs to be taught that hospitality should never be treated the way your hospitality has been done. So it's a, a hard lesson for all of the Greek culture. You will treat your guests with reverence and respect. And you will not outstay your welcome. You will not uh, show disrespect to strangers in your court. When you travel, you will uh, expect hospitality and you will give it in return. And there's so a great deal. And when, when it comes to older men, you will speak to them in this fashion. When you speak to women, you will speak to them in this fashion, etc. So there's a lot of social manners being taught through this. And that's part of the uh, the morality of the whole tale. But in, in chapter 20, uh, uh, we move on to Odysseus and um, a little bit of insight into his character. We don't get stream of consciousness. We don't get, note here, it says uh, Odysseus' heart was growling inside him. We don't get um, words coming out as we do in the modern novel where you actually get uh, him speaking uh, inside of his head. The way they show it in films is they, they show a character looking like that and voice and mouth not moving, but then you hear his words. So that's, that's, those are the thoughts that are going on inside of his head. We don't get that in uh, this sort of narrative. It's all active. The speeches are external. But, but Homer, the poet, tells us that he was angry and compares him actually to a female dog. As a bitch facing an unknown man stands over her callow puppies, so not just a dog, but one that's protecting the little ones. So there's a tenderness to this. And growls and rages to fight, so Odysseus' heart was growling inside him as he looked on these wicked actions. He struck himself on the chest and spoke to his heart and scolded it, now he speaks. Bear up my heart, you have had worse to endure before this on that day when the irresistible Cyclops ate up my strong companions. But you endured it until intelligence got you out of the cave. 
though you expected to perish, so he spoke. Addressing his own dear heart within him, and the heart, in great obedience, endured and stood it without complaint, but the man himself was twisting and turning. So note the conflict within him, but note that the head is overruling his heart. His, his passions want him to strike out at the injustice he sees in front of him, but his head overrules his heart. This is exemplary. This is the model. This is how Homer wants people to behave. Don't be ruled by your passions. As strong as they are, as just as the cause is, make sure you control yourself. That's how to be wise. It's not just about the deception. I, I've highlighted that because it's, so it's really striking and, and troubling. But what is wise is controlling your passions. That is wisdom. Uh, in our day, we're told that being true to yourself is expressing your feelings all the time. I'm going to tell you who I am and I'll tell you how I feel. Not a great idea in general. There are times when you should do that and there are times when you should not do that. What you shouldn't do is just because you feel something strongly to vent it. Psychologists may tell you you should. I don't think the psychologists are correct. Because it may come out in a way that's unhelpful. If there's injustice, it needs to be dealt with. But again, there's a way of doing that. And it's not just thoughtless explosion like a child. So Odysseus is moved by the injustice. And Athena, for as a reward for his ability to master himself. By the way, this is a qualification in scripture as well, that if you can't govern yourself, you can't govern a household. If you can't govern a household, you can't govern the church. There's a mastery, a self-mastery that is a prerequisite to this. If you act like a child, you're going to be a terrible parent. You don't have control over your, your feelings and you can't order your life. You're, you can't order your household. If you can't order your household, how are you going to order other people's? And if you can't order the the church, how can you order, how can you be a, a political ruler? And there, so that from small beginnings, and the idea that uh, is picked up in the Greeks is that the head is like a citadel and the chest is like a, uh, like a, a barracks. And your passions are like the, the people. And it, it's like an army. And the general needs to work through the, the chest, which is the barracks, to make the soldiers subdue the passions. It gets presented repeatedly in Greek literature as a way of thinking about this. So use your reason. Be rational at all times. Um, but Athena is so pleased with Odysseus's ability to do this that she says, oh, I have skipped over that. Yes. And then once again, uh, uses an epic simile as a a uh, man with a paunch pudding that has been filled with blood and fat tosses it back and forth over a blazing fire, and the pudding itself strains hard to be cooked quickly like a sausage. So he was twisting and turning back and forth, meditating how, though he was alone against many, he could lay hands on the shameless suitors. And at this time, Athena, descending from the sky, came close to him and wore the shape of a lady. She came and stood above his head and spoke a word to him. Why are you wakeful now, O most wretched of all men? Here is your house, and here is your wife in the house, and here is your son, and he is the kind of son any man would long for. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered her, and he recognizes who it is. Yes, O goddess, all you have said was fair and orderly, yet still here is something the heart inside me is pondering. How? How can I, um, when I'm alone against many, lay hands on the shameless sitters? And they are always here in a body. And here is a still bigger problem that my heart is pondering, even if by the grace of Zeus and yourself, I kill them. How then shall I make my escape? It is what I would have you think on. He doesn't just want vengeance. He wants to live onwards. And when he kills the suitors, 
Who's going to be angry? Like, there's, that's a lot of men. Who's going to be angry? All their families. So even if I take all of them out somehow, which I don't see how I can, but even if I do, how am I going to deal with the consequences of this action? And know that he's thinking ahead. This is, a, this is a resourceful man thinking of consequences of actions before he commits the actions. And so he turns to her because he has no idea how this will happen. And then in turn, the goddess, gray out Athena said to him, stubborn man, anyone trusts even a lesser companion than I, who is mortal and does not have so many ideas, but I'm a god. And though it, though it all, through it all, rather, I keep watch over you in every endeavor of yours. And now I tell you this plainly, even though there were 50 battalions of mortal people standing around us, furious to kill in the spirit of battle, even so, you could drive away their cattle and fat sheep. So let sleep take you now. There is annoyance in lying awake and on guard all night. You will soon be out of your troubles. So she spoke and scattered slumber over his eyelids. And she, shining among goddesses, went back to Olympus. But when the sleeping had caught hold of him, a relaxing sleep, slipping the cares from his mind, at that time his virtuous wife awakened in turn and cried, sitting up in her soft bed. And after she had satisfied all her desires with weeping, then she, shining among women, prayed first of all to Artemis. Artemis is the virgin, Why should, but also the goddess of the hunt. Artemis, goddess and queen, daughter of Zeus, how I wish that with the cast of your arrow you could take the life from inside my heart. This moment, or that soon the storm wind would snatch me away and be gone, carrying me down misty pathways. Note how Homer uses the gods to address the psychological distresses of his characters. It's an externalizing. It's not all internalized. It's externalizing as if the whole cosmos is interested in what happens inside of us. And in Homer's view, that is the case. Everything in us is also important outside of us. There is a sort of, it's not just a soul, solely private matter. Um, <clears throat> so we meet these two characters and, and, uh, and she has a rather sleepless night, but there are good omens in the morning. And the good omens are that uh, for Penelope upon waking. Uh, uh, so Odysseus is aware of Penelope crying and he calls out and prays to Zeus. Line 98, with his hands lifted. Father Zeus, if willingly you gods led me over wet and dry, to my land after giving too much affliction, let one of the waking people send me an omen from inside the house and let Zeus also show me an outside portent. So he spoke in prayer and Zeus of the councils heard him. Immediately he sent his thunder from shining Olympus high above the clouds and noble Odysseus was happy. And from the house, a mill woman sent him an omen. She was nearby where the shepherd of the host had set up his hand mills and there, Twelve women in all had been bending to grind the wheat and the barley flour men's marrow. The others, since they'd finished grinding their wheat, by now were sleeping, but this one had not ended her work, and she was the weakest. She stopped the mill and spoke aloud a sign for her master. Father Zeus, you who are lord of the gods and people, now you have thundered aloud from the starry sky, though there is no cloud. You show this forth a Important for someone. Grant now also for wretched me this prayer that I make you. On this day, let the suitors take. Let the suitors take uh, for the last and latest time their desirable feasting in the halls of Odysseus. For it is they who have broken my knees with sore heart sore labor as I grind the meal for them. Let this be their final feasting. So not only Odysseus, but one of the women who's preparing meals for the suitors also. So the injustice is crying out from the land, from the people. 
And so she spoke, and great Odysseus welcomed the ominous speech and the thunder of Zeus. He thought he would punish the suitors. So a sense of omens, the gods giving a vent to their, or giving voice to their assent that Odysseus punished the injustice. Uh, and the suitors arrive in preparation for the festival. Uh, the suitors arrive and um, there is violence done to uh, Ctesippus. And let me get to this very briefly here. It's 335. What, this is one of the suitors, and the suitor throws something at Odysseus. And Odysseus ducks it. He avoided this by an easy shift of his head. He smiled in his anger, a very sardonic smile. The hoof hit the wall of the well-built house, and Telemachus spoke now and scolded Ctesippus. Ctesippus, it was better for your heart that it had happened, so you missed the stranger. He avoided your missile. I would have struck you with my sharp spear, fair in the middle, and instead of your marriage, your father would have been busy with your funeral here. Let none display any rudeness here in my house. Note the difference, the transformation in Telemachus. You do injustice in my house, and I will execute justice immediately. I now know, and all know it, better and worse alike, but before now I was only an infant. Even so, we've had to look on this and endure it all, the sheep flocks being slaughtered, the wine drunk up, and the food, since it is hard for one man to stand off many. Come then, no longer do me harm in your hostility, but if you are determined to murder me with the sharp bronze, then that would be my wish also, since it would be far better than to have to go on watching forever these shameful activities, yes, being battered about, or to see you rudely mishandling the serving women all about the beautiful place. So he spoke, and all of them stayed stricken to silence. So he rebukes them for their bad conduct, and they accept it. Uh, and another prophecy comes from Phi Theoclimenos, the gods renowned. And I'll skip over to 21. Uh, and it's ominous of what's about to happen to the suitors. But now, and now we're getting to the conclusion of the plot. Um, oh, by the way, have I skipped over this? I think I have. Or have I? Well, I'll find out in a second here. My notes are telling me that there is a dream of Penelope in chapter 19. Is that correct, or have I got this wrong? I, I'm wondering what Penelope's dream is. Is it 19 towards the end? Uh, 535 to 553. Of the geese? I did. You're right. I did talk about that. Okay, good, 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 good. So 21, but now the goddess Greia Athena put it in the mind of the daughter of Icarius, circumspect Penelope, to set the bow before the suitors in the gray iron. So now there's going to be a test, and the test is also a sort of a trial. Now the whole of the Odyssey has been a trial to prove that the just man is just. Now it's a sort of a trial by uh, a, a contest, just like they have in the Olympics, and will discern in this case, who the man will be that will marry Penelope. So the one that is able to string the bow and shoot the arrow through the axe heads, through the holes in the axe head. Have you ever seen an old-fashioned axe like made out of wood? And then there's a hole in it through which the metal, when it's cast, sticks in it. So it's like that. So there's a hole in the, the axe handles, and they, they line them up, and then you have to shoot the arrow through it at a distance. Now, that might sound easy or hard, I have no idea whether it does, but there's this thing called gravity and you have to shoot it perfectly straight for it long enough so that it can go through the holes in the handles. So it's not just that you, you're accurate, you have to be strong enough to shoot it fast enough so that it doesn't hit one of the handles. In addition to stringing the bow, which apparently in itself is a an, uh, heroic feat. 
that none but Odysseus can do. So the the uh, the bows are on the wall and they're straight, and then you have to bend it first of all, and then you have to slip the uh, uh, the gut of the string over it on the other end. So if you like, you have to hold it first, and then you have to somehow put the the string to it as well. You know what I'm talking about here? Yeah. You have to do both of those things. Uh, and that will be the contest. So Penelope creates the contest that's going to discern who marries her next, not knowing that Odysseus is among the suitors here at this point. So she comes down in the gray iron in the house of Odysseus, the contest, the beginning of the slaughter. So she ascended the high staircase of her own house in her solid hand, took up the beautiful brazen and artfully curved key with an ivory handle upon it. With her attendant women, she went to the inmost recess of the chamber. They were stored away the master's possessions. Bronze was there and gold and difficulty wrought iron. And there the backstrung bow was stored away and the quiver to hold the arrows. There were many painful shafts inside it. These were gifts from a friend whom he met in Lacedaemon. Sparta, Iphitus, son of Eurotus, one like the immortal gods. These two had encountered each other in the house of Hiran, where we hear about how the, uh, he got the boat. Um, and the whole story of this particular bow and where he got it and how the hero gets particular, a particular armament. And the armament has a story. Sometimes it has a name. In later renditions, we'll get shields that are famous, like the shield of Achilles in the Iliad. I think it's Iliad 18. Um, and in later Knight's Tales, the sword will have a name even. This is a famous sword. It's not just any old sword. It's this sword with a name. And here's how he got that sword. And here's what that sword once did. And here who's, is who forged it. And this sword has never been... Uh, when it's gone into battle, has never failed, but to cut through other swords, etc. That sort of a hero has a hero's weapons. That same the same here. Uh, but let me skip over that line forty-two. When she, shining among the women, had come to the chamber and had come up to the oaken threshold, which the carpenter once had expertly planed and drawn it true to a chalk line. Let me skip over this. There it is. To a chalk line uh, and fitted the doorpost to it and joined on the shining door leaves. First, she quickly set the fastening free of the hook. Then she inserted the key in and knocked the bolt upward, pushing the key straight in. And the door bellowed aloud as a bull does when he feeds in his pasture. Such was the noise the splendid doors made. So a big groan struck with the key. And now they spread open and out she goes. And then she sits down and comes to the suitors and promises marriage to the best archer. Hear me, 68, now, you haughty suitors, who have been using this house for your incessant eating and drinking, though it belongs to a man who has been gone for a long time, never have you been able to bring any other saying before me, but only your desire to make me your wife and marry me. You haven't tried to appeal to my reason. You haven't appealed to uh, your good intentions. You haven't appealed to how you will be a good man, a good husband, a good king. You've simply appealed to your passions. I really want you, Penelope. Ooh. That's it. That's all you've ever done. Tell me how much you want me. So, what sort of men are you? There's a, is there anything good in any of you? So she's upbraiding them for their bad character. But come, you suitors, since here is a prize set out before you, for I shall bring you the great bow of God like Odysseus. And the one who takes the bow in his hands, strings it with the greatest ease, and sends an arrow clean through all the twelve axes, shall be the one I go away with, forsaking this house when I was a bride, a lovely place and full of good living. I think that even in my dreams I shall never forget it. So she spoke and told the noble swineherd Eumaeus, to put the bow in the gray iron in front of the suitors. Eumaeus accepted it in tears and put them before them. And the ox herd also wept when he saw the bow of his master. But Antinous scolded the two of them and spoke out and named them. 
you foolish countrymen who never think of tomorrow, poor wretches, why are you streaming tears and troubling the lady now and stirring her heart when she has enough already of sadness her heart rests on? Now she has lost a dear husband. Go and sit in silence and eat, or else take your crying out of the door and be gone, but leave the bow where you put it, a prize for the suitors to strive for. A terrible one. I do not think that this well-polished bow can ever be strung easily. There is no man among the lot of us who is such a one as Odysseus used to be. I myself have seen him, and I remember well, though I was still young and childish. So he spoke. So he spoke. But the spirit inside his heart was hopeful that he would be able to string the bow and shoot through the iron. But he was to be the first to get a taste of the arrow from the hands of blameless Odysseus, to whom he now paid no attention as he sat in Odysseus's halls and encouraged all his companions. Now the hallowed prince Telemachus spoke a word to them. Oh, how Zeus, the son of Cronos, has made me witless. My own beloved mother, though she is sensible, tells me that she will forsake this house and go away with another. And then, in the witlessness of my heart, I laugh and enjoy it. But come, you suitors, since here is a prize set before you. A woman. There is none like her in all the Achaean country, neither in sacred Pelos nor Argos, nor in Mycenae, but here in Ithaca itself, nor on the dark mainland. You yourselves also know this. Then why should I praise my mother? But come on, no longer drag things out with delays, nor turn back still from the stringing of the bow, so that we may see it. I myself am also willing to attempt the bow. Then, if I can put the string on it and shoot it through the iron, my queenly mother would not go off with another and leave me sorrowing here in the house since I would still be found here as one now able to take up his father's glorious prizes. He has no intention of marrying his mother, by the way. <laughs> but that would be the end of it then. He spoke and sprung upright, laying aside from his shoulders the red cloak, and from his, and his shoulders took off the sharp sword. He began by setting up the axes, digging long, one long trench for them all, and drawing it true to a chalk line and stamped down the earth around him, wonder seized the onlookers at how orderly he set them up. He never had seen them before. He went then and tried the bow, standing on the threshold. Three times he made it vibrate, boom, boom, straining to bend it. And three times he gave over the effort. Yet in his heart was hopeful of hooking the string to the bow and sending a shaft through the iron. And now, pulling the bow for the fourth time, he would have strung it. He would have strung it, but Odysseus stopped him, though he was eager, making a signal with his head. The hallowed prince Telemachus said to them, shame on me. I must be then a coward and weakling, or else I am still too young, and my hands have yet no confidence to defend myself against a man who has started a quarrel. Come then, you who in your strength are greater than I am, make your attempts in the bow and let us finish the contest. So he spoke and put the bow from him leaning it on the ground, etc. Now, what we see is Telemachus is much stronger than he's letting on. He's, and Odysseus is giving him the nod. <laughs> Don't show how capable you are. Because at the moment, we were, we're, we were going to catch them by surprise. They have no idea. And, and the suitors, as we know, tried to string the bow and they repeatedly failed. Each one, they can't even string the bow. Not strong enough to do it. And Odysseus, interestingly, reveals himself to uh, uh, his, his friend uh, Eumaeus at this point. Finally, the swineherd who is loyal to him, he reveals himself to him. And uh, pushbacks his, his, uh, the rags that covered his great scar. And when... Uh, these two had examined it and re recognized everything. They burst out weeping and threw their arms around wise Odysseus. So Eumaeus and, and the, uh, the swineherd and the cowherd, they both now who he, know who he is. And so they're thinking, so they're in on the, 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 uh, the plot. 
And what they will do is remove the weapons from the hall, which would have been a great threat at this point. But they remove the weapons from the hall, and Odysseus asks if he can try the bow. We all know it's going to happen now. The suspense is building. It doesn't matter if we know it's going to happen, by the way. It's still, like, delightful. This is like a great film that you've seen more than once, but you know it, and the buildup has been so magnificent, and the whole story has been pushing for this sort of denouement, the plot. We're waiting and waiting and waiting, and he suffered and he suffered and he suffered, and now it's been faded, and the time is now. It's now, 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 and it's like, yes! String it and take them out. And so he, this is maybe just me, well, let me have a try at that. Who could string bows then? Um, put it away for now for our good time, but we shall leave all the axes standing where they are. I do not believe anyone will come on and steal them away from the halls of Odysseus, son of Laertes. Come, let the wine steward put a round of wine in the goblet so we can make a libation and pour the curved, put away the curved bow. Then at dawn instruct Melanthius, who is the goat herd, to bring in goats, those far the best in all of the goat flocks. So they decide... Well, this contest is the but we'll forget about that. So let's go back to who's thirsty. Okay, back to the drinking. Okay. But then Odysseus, as they poured this, resourceful Odysseus spoke to them in crafty intention. 275. Now hear me, hear me now, you who are suitors of our glorious cream, while I speak out what the heart within my breast urges. Above all, I entreat Eurymachus and the godlike Antinous since what he said also was fair and orderly. Let the bow be for the time. Give it over to the divinities, and tomorrow the god will give success to whomever he wishes. But come now, give me the well-polished bow, so that among you I may try out my strength and hands, to see if I still have force in my flexible limbs as there has been in time past, or whether my wandering and lack of good care have ruined me. So he spoke. But all of them were wildly indignant and feared that he might take the well-polished bow and string it. But Ant now Antinous scolded him and spoke out and named him. Ah, wretched stranger, you have no sense, not even a little. Is it not enough that you dine in peace among us who are violent men and are deprived of no fair portion, but listen to our conversation and what we say, but there is no other vagabond and newcomer who is allowed to hear us talk. The honeyed wine has hurt you, as it has distracted others as well who gulp it down without thinking in season. It was the wine also that drove the centaur, famous Eurytion, distracted in the palace of great-hearted Parathoas when he visited the Laphis. His brain went wild with drinking. Grief and rage seized the heroes, and he sprang up and drugged them, etc., etc. So basically, you're drunk. Sit down and shut up. You've had too much wine. And that led to bad things, and it's going to lead to bad things for you as well if you won't sit down. But, and so he announces great trouble if you string this bow. Don't, don't you even, like, if you string this bow, watch out for you. You will meet no kind of courtesy in our group, and we shall put you into a black ship and take you across the sea. But Penelope makes an answer to him. Antinous, it is neither fair nor just to browbeat any guest of Telemachus who comes to visit him. It's not courteous. Do you imagine that if this stranger in the confidence of hands and strength should string the bow, great bow of Odysseus, that he would take me home with him and make me his wife? No, he himself has no such thought in the heart within him. Let none of you be sorrowful at heart in his feasting here for such a reason. There, there's no likelihood of it. And there's a little back and forth, and again, a lot of discussion of this. And then Penel <laughs> and of course, then Odysseus finally gets his shot at the bow, and he strings it really easily. Penelope goes away, and strings it, and then tests the string, plucks it in his right hand like a musical instrument. He tested the bowstring, and it gave back an excellent 
sound like the voice of a swallow. So the wood has not been compromised by any worms or anything. This is a strong, sturdy boat. It's not going to break. The string also has integrity. And a great sorrow fell now upon the suitors, and all their color was changed. And now the gods get involved. And Zeus, showing forth his portents, thundered mightily at that moment. You imagine if you're watching a movie at that moment, the thunder, you know it's coming. Because the gods are, Odysseus is angry, the gods are angry, and these men are arrayed all around him, and we know what is about to ensue. And hearing this, long-suffering great Odysseus was happy that the son of devious devising Kronos had sent him a portent. He chose out a swift arrow that lay beside him uncovered on the table, but the others were still stored up inside the hollow quiver, and presently the Achaeans must learn their nature. Taking the string and the head grooves, he drew to the middle grip, and from the very chair where he sat, bending the bow before him, let the arrow fly. Nor missing any axes, not missing any axles from the first handle on, but the bronze weighted arrow passed through all and out the other end. He spoke to Telemachus. Telemachus, your guest that sits in your halls does not often fail you. I miss no part of the mark, nor have I made much work of stringing the bow. The strength is still sound within me, and not as the suitors said in their scorn, making little of me. Now is the time for their dinner to be served, the Achaeans, in the daylight. Then follow with the other entertainment, the dance and the lyre, for these things come at the end of the feasting. He spoke and nodded to him with his brows, and Telemachus, dear son of godlike Odysseus, put his sharp sword about him and closed his own hand over his spear and took his position close beside him and near next the chair all armed in bright bronze. So it, the, the, it, the suspense keeps building. Isn't it fantastic? Now resourceful Odysseus stripped his rags from him and sprang up atop the great threshold, holding his bow in the quiver filled with arrows and scattered out the swift shafts before him on the ne ground next to his feet and spoke his word to the suitors. Note he doesn't just kill them. There's speeches all along, throughout, and the speeches are part of the suspense and part of the virtue of the encounter is that there's uh, explanations for what's happening and justifications. There's, there's speech accompanying all of the events. Holding his bow and quiver, and here is a task that has been achieved without any deception. Now I shall shoot at another mark, one that no man yet has struck if I can hit it, and Apollo grant me the glory. He spoke and steered a bitter arrow against Antinous. He was on the point of lifting up a fine two-handled goblet of gold and had it in his hands and was moving it so as to drink of the wine, and in his heart there was no thought of death. For who would think that one man, alone in a company of many men at their feasting, though he were a very strong one, would ever inflict death upon him in dark doom? But Odysseus, aiming at this man, struck him in the throat with an arrow, and clean through the soft part of the neck, the point was driven. He slumped away to one side, and out of his stricken hand fell the goblet, and up and through his nostrils there burst a thick jet of mortal blood. And with a thrust of his foot he kicked back the table from him, so that all the good food was scattered on the ground, bread and baked meats together, but all the suitors clamored about the house when they saw that the man was fallen, sprang up from their seats, and ranged about the room, throwing their glances every way along the well-built walls. But there was never a shield there, nor any strong spear for them. But they scolded Odysseus in words of anger, saying, Stranger, it is badly done to hit men. You will never achieve any more trials. Now your sudden destruction is certain. For now you have struck down the man who is far the greatest of the youth of Ithaca. For that the vultures shall eat you. Each spoke at random. For they thought he had not intended to kill the man. Poor fools. And that they had not yet realized how over all of them the terms of death were now hanging. 
But looking darkly upon them, resourceful Odysseus answered, You dogs, you never thought that I would any more come back from the land of Troy. And because of that, you despoiled my household and forcibly took my serving women to sleep beside you and sought to win my wife while I was still alive, fearing neither the immortal gods who hold the wide heaven nor any resentment sprung from men to be yours in the future. Now, upon all of you, the terms of destruction are fastened. They have no idea who this is, but he's back. I'm back from Troy. He, who's, who, who, they don't know who it is still, but back from Troy is a pretty good tip off. So he spoke, and the green fear took hold of all of them, and each man looked about him for a way to escape sheer death. Only Eurymachus spoke up and gave him an answer. If in truth you are Odysseus of Ithaca, come home. What you have said is fair about all the wickedness done you by the Achaeans, much in your house and much in the country. But now the man is down who is responsible for all this. Antinous, you're right, you did the right thing. But, but that, yeah, he, he's a bad guy. Got, got what he deserved. It was he who pushed this action, not so much that he wanted the marriage or cared for it, but with other things in mind, when the son of Cronus would not grant him to lie in wait for your son and kill him, and then be king himself in the district of strong-founded Ithaca. Now he has perished by his own fate. Then spare your own people, and afterward we will make public reparation for all that's been eaten and drunk in your halls, settling each upon himself an assessment of 20 oxen. We will pay it back in bronze and gold to you until your heart is softened. Till then, we cannot blame you for being angry. Smart man. Diplomat. Trying to get out of the situation. Acknowledges the injustice. Blames it all on one man. There's the scapegoat. He did it. Okay. We can be reasonable together. Then looking darkly at him, resourceful Odysseus answered, because do you believe what he's just said? Do you think they're going to give him the 20 oxen? Odysseus doesn't. He doesn't think that they're going to do anything like he just suggested. Eurymachus, if you gave me all your father's possessions, all that you have now and what you could add from elsewhere, even so I would not stay my hands from the slaughter until I had taken revenge for all the suitor's transgression. Now the choice has been set before you, either to fight me, or run if any of you can escape death in its spirits. But I think not one man will escape from sheer destruction. So he spoke. And the other's knees and the heart within them went slack. But Eurymachus cried a second time to the suitors. Dear friends, now this man will not restrain his invincible hands. But since he's got the polished bow in the quiver, he will shoot at us from the smooth threshold until he has killed us one and all. Then let us all remember our warcraft. Draw your swords and hold the table before you to ward off the arrows of sudden death. Let us all make a rush against him together and try to push him back from the doors and the threshold and go through the town. So the hue and, hue and cry could be most quickly raised and perhaps this man will now have shot for the last time. So he spoke aloud and drew from his side the sharp sword, brazen and edged on either side and made a rush at him, crying his terrible cry at the same time noble Odysseus shot an arrow and struck him in the chest by the nipple and the speeding arrow fixed in his liver and his sword tumbled out of his hand on the floor and as he sprawling over the table doubled and fell and on the floor the good food was scattered and the two-handed goblet he struck the ground with his forehead and in his paroxysm of pain and kicking with both feet, rattled the chair, and over his eyes the death mist drifted. And now they keep on going. So Amphenomos comes, and the battle ensues, and the battle continues. And um, uh, the goat herd, Melanthius, loyal to the suitors because Melanthius is a bad servant as well, brings arms to the suitors to aid them because he recognizes 
Odysseus is not in a merciful mood, to put it mildly. He's going to take care. everyone who's acted unjustly, that we're all going to die, and I'm one of them. So I'm going to throw my lot in with the suitors here and bring them weapons. Uh, and um, comes to this, uh, and Odysseus at this is nervous, to put it mildly. 147, then the knees of Odysseus went slack and the heart within him as he saw them putting the armor about them and shaking the long spears in their hands. He thought it was monstrous treason and he now spoke in wing words to Telemachus. Telemachus, some one of the women here in the palace or Melanthius has made an evil attack upon us. Then the thoughtful Telemachus said to him in answer, Father, it was my own mistake and there is no other to blame. I left the door of the chamber which can close tightly open at an angle. One of these men was a better observer than I. Go now, noble Eumaeus, and close the chamber door and see if it is one of the women doing this or Melanthius, son of Dolios, which is what I think. And now as these two are conversing thus, Melanthius the Gohort went back into the chamber to bring more splendid armor, but the noble swineherd sighted him. Quickly he spoke a word to Odysseus standing close by. Uh, son of Laertes and seed of Zeus, resourceful Odysseus. There is that deadly man again, the one we suspected on his way into the chamber. Now give me your true instructions, whether if I prove stronger than he is, I am to kill him or bring him back here to you so he can pay for the many transgressions. And Odysseus says, Telemachus and I will hold off the, hardy, the haughty suitors for all their fury here inside the palace. You two twist the feet of Melanthius and his arms behind him, put him away in the chamber and fasten boards behind him, then make him secure with a braided rope and hoist him upward along the high column till you fetch him up to the roof beams. Thus, while he still stays alive, he will suffer harsh torment. <laughs> so it's not, we're not, we're not kill him yet. Let make him suffer a hanging from a rope and then we'll take care of him afterwards. Off he goes. Okay, so... But now we have the suitors who are armed, and they, only the two men. And it's going to go hard upon them, but Athena intercedes and helps Odysseus. And the suitors basically die to a man. They all go down. Um, and all save the singer, Demodokos, who sung the, the, the stories of the heroes of Troy, and uh, the herald are spared. Only those two. And of course, Eumaeus and company. But everyone else uh, is killed. And Eurycleia is called his, um, his uh, nursemaid, which we saw had recognized his scar. Let me skip over that down here. And this is rather interesting uh, because he speaks to her and tells her to summon the maids. And note her response is rather interesting. So Telemachus tells her to come in and uh, she finds uh, uh, she comes in to speak to Odysseus and she sees the slaughter all around her. And Odysseus says to her, 4.10, uh, Keep your joy in your heart, old dame. Stop, do not raise up the cry. It is not piety to glory over so many slain men. Isn't that interesting? He's killed them all, but it's not a glorious thing to, to uh, or not, it's not a pious thing to delight in the slaughter, even though he's committed the slaughter. It's wrong. Justice has been done, but don't personalize it by indulging it too much. And I'll say to you this in, in the Greek theater, when they did atrocities, on, uh, they always took place backstage. They never showed the visual images of it. There was something they regarded as dehumanizing about the pornography of violence. Also even expressed there. So they have a suspicion of the passions, but they also don't want to see 
uh, this and they to some degree recognize that there's a bloodlust in people that they love seeing these things, but we ought to suppress that as well. That's what lies behind the comment here. Uh, and but then and then Eurycleia suggests that she'll tell him which of the maids have been faithful to him, because he sees that she is moved and and is delighted at what he's done. Like a little bit and a little bit too delighted at it, and he notices this. The the maid who suffered for twenty years is she is happier than I am about this. She wants more of this, and vengeance is what she wants. And and so she says to him to Odysseus. So my child, I will tell you the whole truth of the matter. You have 50 serving women here in your palace, and these I have taught to work at their own tasks, the carding of wool and how to endure their own slavery. Of these 50, 12 in all have taken to immorality. They pay no attention to me or even to Penelope. Telemachus has but lately come of age, and his mother would not let him be in charge of the serving women. But come, let me go up to the shining upper chamber and tell your wife some god is sent down to sleep upon her, then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered her, Do not waken her yet, but tell these women who have been shameful in their devisings to come here to my presence. And they come in, and uh, the women uh, huddle in with cries of sorrow and big tears falling, because of course many of them were attached to the suitors. And... Odysseus directs them and hurries them on and they carry the bodies out and then after that they have to clean the tables and chairs and Telemachus says to his father I would not take the away the lives of these creatures by any clean death for they have showered abuse on the head of my mother and on my own head too and they have slept with the suitors so he spoke, and taking the cable of a dark, proud ship, fastened it to... These are traitors in their own household. They've been abusive towards Telemachus and his mother. They've slept with the suitors. They're complicit in it. So it's tre treason in addition uh, to everything else. Um, and uh, so now comes the justice for them. And their work was in it. But Odysseus said to his dear nurse Eurycleia, Bring me brimstone, old dame, the cure of evils, and bring me fire so I can sulfur the hall and tell Penelope to come here now together with her attendant women and tell all the serving maids to come here to the palace. Uh, then the beloved nurse Eurycleia said to him and answered, All this you have said, my child, was fair and orderly. But come now, let me bring you a mantle and tunic and do not stand thus here in the hall with your broad shoulders covered over with rags as they are. That would be scandalous. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered her, Before all this, let me have the fire in my palace. He spoke, and the dear nurse Eurycleia did not disobey him. She brought him out the fire and brimstone, and Odysseus cleaned his place, house, his palace house and courtier alike with sulfur. The old woman went off to the fine house of Odysseus to take the message to the women, tell them to gather. They came from the main house and their hands held torches. And he cleans this. And the serving woman clung to him, greeted him, made much of him, and kissed him on his head and on his shoulders and hands, admiring him in sweet longing for lamentation and tears took hold of him. He recognized all these women. And now comes Penelope. So up to this point, and this is a, the story seems over because the battle has just wiped out the unrighteousness of the suitors. And to the point where not only are they dead, but they've cleansed the halls. It's now been burnt clean, totally made back into a just and orderly household. The injustice has been swept clean. But Odysseus is not yet reunited with his wife. And so Odysseus, the Odyssey is not only a... Uh, story of revenge or justice it's about Odysseus's homecoming and until he reunites with his wife and restores uh, the good of their marriage which he longed for pining on the beach if you recall in tears and she likewise at home until that's rectified the story's not done so that it's a it's a fascinating tale from that from that count and it highlights the importance of the intimacy between 
a husband and wife to the Greeks who read it as well. They recognize the good of marriage is uh, central to this epic as well. At any rate, um, Penelope says Eurycleia, wake dear child so that with your own eyes you can see all your days you, what you've been longing for. Odysseus is here. Odysseus is here. He's in the house. The laden is coming and he's killed the haughty suitors who were afflicting his house and using force on his son and eating his property. Circumspect, Penelope said to her and answered, Dear nurse, the gods have driven you crazy. They are both able to change a very sensible person into a senseless one and to set the light wit on the way of discretion. They have set you awry. Before now your thoughts were orderly. Why do you insult me when my heart is heavy with sorrows? By talking in this wild way and waking me from a happy sleep which had come and covered my eyes and then held them fastened. For I have not had such a sleep as this one since the time when Odysseus went to that evil. Not to be mentioned, Il Ilion, Troy. But go now and take yourself back into the palace. If any of those other women who are here with me had come with a message like yours and wakened me from my slumber, I would have sent her back on her way to the hall in a hateful fashion for doing it. It shall be your age that saves you. Then the beloved nurse Eurycleia said to her in answer, I'm not insulting you, dear child. It is all true. Odysseus is here. He is in the house, just as I tell you. He is that stranger guest whom all in the house were abusing. Telemachus has known that he was here for a long time, but he was discreet and did not betray the plans of his father, so he might punish those overbearing men for their violence. So she spoke, and Penelope, in her joy, sprang up from the bed and embraced the old women, her eyes streaming tears, and she spoke to her and addressed her in winged words. Come, dear nurse, and give me a true account of the matter, whether he really has come back to his house, as you tell me, to lay his hands on the shameless suitors, though he was only one, and they were always lying in wait in a body. Then the beloved nurse Eurycleia said to her in answer, I did not see, I was not told, but I heard the outcry of them being killed. We, hidden away in the strong-built storerooms, sat there terrified and the closed doors held us prisoner until from inside the great hall your son Telemachus has summoned me because his father told him to do it. There I found Odysseus standing among the dead men he had killed and they covered the hardened earth lying piled on each other around him. You would have cheered to see him spattered over with gore and battle filth like a lion. Now they all lie together. And Penelope's response to this is, again, to check her bloodlust. <laughs> Dear nurse, do not yet laugh aloud in triumph. You know how welcome he would be if he appeared in the palace to all, but above all to me and the son we gave birth to. No, this story is not true as you tell it. Rather, some one of the immortals has killed the haughty suitors in anger over their wicked deeds and heart-butting heart hurting, rather, violence. For these men paid no attention at all to any man on earth who came in their way, no matter if he were base or noble. So they suffered for their own recklessness. But Odysseus has lost his homecoming and lost his life far from Achaia. And she rebukes her and back with it. But she won't believe it. She will not believe that Odysseus has come home. And I, I think I mentioned what seems plausible to me that in this, and I don't know what your opinions are on this, but it seems to me this is plausible for somebody who is in a state of deep depression. Remember, it's been 20 years that Odysseus has been absent, and uh, Penelope has managed to hold on because of her great virtue. But the suffering she's under, undergone is so great that she's traumatized by it, and can't get out of the trauma. Like we talk about post-traumatic stress disorder these days. We give a, a, a name to it. But she's traumatized. 
she can't she can't imagine that this is the case uh, that, that it could be otherwise than this the reality is it's 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 sunk too deep in her for her to imagine that anything other than this could continue to prevail and if the gods have slain the suitors that's good but it cannot be the case that Odysseus is back because if I if I believe you in that my hopes get up and if my hopes should fail my heart will not be able to endure it so they don't she doesn't want to hope even though she feels joy at the sound of this but it cannot be so she can't imagine she can't receive such good news it's it's incredible to her um so penelope does come down to odysseus but she refuses to speak to him because she thinks it's not Odysseus. You imagine Odysseus by this point. This man has endured everything he's endured. He's killed all the suitors. He gets to speak to his wife, and his wife's like, no chance. You're not Odysseus. I'm not, I'm not having this. <laughs> and he, this, is, this is the hardest thing he's ever had to endure. It, comment at the back, or question, or whatever. I can't hear. The loom that she was weaving the... Well, that the women of the ancient world always are portrayed with the distaff that they're spinning on. It's part, it's part of... You know, they don't have a clothing industry. They weave their own clothing and so forth. But it's a way of, of uh, in this case, deceiving the, the suitors, right? She weaves it and unweaves it. And uh, it can symbolize a great many things. And it does seem symbolic as well. It's not just that she's doing it. It seems to symbolize something. And later writers will associate weaving with treachery and deceit. Uh, and um, But it will be interwoven, the, th the strands and so forth. And in Latin, it will be, the, the web will be called a textum, by the way. A text just like a text is woven um, but I don't know what that exact what what's your connection with this here because she's busy away that maybe it, it's busy work it occupies her attention like it's like therapeutic but what are you thinking oh though I don't even know if it was a symbol of hope for her the web that she was weaving. I think it was more just a strategy or a tactic to hold up. And you're right in the sense that why is she bothering to do that then? Like, why would you put off the marriage to the suitors if you didn't think Odysseus was ever going to come back anyway? And I think it's because the idea of marrying the suitors was so hateful to her. It's not just that she longed for her husband. She thought he was dead. But it's more that she these men were not even a pale shadow of her husband. They were only lecherous men. There was no good in them. She didn't want to marry any of them. It's not just that she loved Odysseus. It's she despised them. These are bad men. So it's that much as anything else. So it's not so much hope. It's just contempt for these sorts of men that behave like this. She doesn't want any one of them. Note that's got nothing to do with their appearance, although obviously there's probably a little bit uh, in the narrative, it's more their character is so bad. I, gosh, I do not want to marry any of them. So let me, however I can delay that, let me put that off as long as I possibly can. So I don't see that as hope. I see that as more of, uh, as I say, a coping strategy, avoiding something that's hateful to her. That's how I see it at any rate. Uh, I don't know if I'm right in that. But uh, so Penelope comes down and... Um, uh, speaks to her husband, whom she doesn't recognize as her husband, refuses to recognize as her husband, in fact. And, and, and she says to Odysseus these words, You are so strange. I'm not being proud, nor indifferent, nor puzzled beyond need. 
but I know very well what you looked like when you went in the ship with the sweeping oars from Ithaca. Come then, Eurycleia, and make up a firm bed for him. Okay, so she refuses to acknowledge that he's Odysseus, even though he looks like Odysseus. She says, I know full well what you look like, and you look like that now. But that I don't trust your appearance. Because the gods can feign the appearance of a man. And you're just, it's, you're, there's a god here who's trying to bed me, and I'm not having that. I, there's no way that it's Odysseus, and so not, I'm not going to have this. And so then she comes up with this extraordinary ruse to test him. Note that Odysseus has, does this throughout this, throughout this. So he's always testing and get to try and get people to reveal what they're thinking and so forth. She does it to him. So she outdoes Odysseus in craftiness and deceit and wisdom. Right here at the end. She says this, Come now, Eurycleia, and make up a firm bed for him outside the well-fashioned chamber, that very bed that he himself built. Put the firm bed here outside for him and cover it over with fleeces and blankets and with shining coverlets. So she spoke to her husband, trying him out. But Odysseus spoke in anger to his virtuous-minded lady. What you have said, dear lady, has hurt my heart deeply. What man has put my bed in another place? But it would be difficult for even a very expert one, unless a god coming to help in person were easily to change its position. But there's no mortal man alive, no strong man who lightly could move the weight elsewhere. There is one particular feature in the bed's construction. I myself, no other man, made it. There was a bowl of an olive tree with long leaves growing strongly in the courtyard, and it was thick like a column. I laid down my chamber around this and built it until I finished it with close set stones and roofed it well over and added the compacted doors fitting closely together. Then I cut away the foliage of the long-leaved olive and trimmed the trunk from the roots up, planing it with a brazen adze, well and expertly, and trued it straight to a chalk line, making a bedpost of it, and bored all holes with an auger. I began with this and built my bed until it was finished, and I decorated it with gold and silver and ivory. Then I lashed it with thongs of oxide, dyed bright with purple. There is its character, as I tell you. But I do not know how now, dear lady, whether my bed is still in place or if some man had, has cut underneath the stump of the olive and moved it elsewhere. How on earth could my bed move? Because I put my bed in, it, it's literally a stump of a tree. It's impossible to move. And he's angry that somebody has done this. Who's done such a thing? So he spoke. And her knees... And the heart within her went slack as she recognized the clear proofs that Odysseus had given. But then she burst into tears and ran straight to him, throwing her arms around the neck of Odysseus and kissed his head, saying, Do not be angry with me, Odysseus, since beyond all other men you have the most understanding. The gods granted us misery in jealousy over the thought that we too, always together, would enjoy our youth, and then come to the threshold of old age. Then do not now be angry with me, nor blame me, because I did not greet you, as I do now, at first when I saw you. For always the spirit deep in my very heart was fearful, that some one of mortal men could come my way and deceive me with words. For there are many who scheme for wicked advantage. For neither would the daughter born to Zeus, Helen of Argos, have lain in love with an outlander from another country if she had known that the warlike sons of the Achaeans would bring her home again to the beloved land of her fathers. It was a god who stirred her to do the shameful thing she did. And never before had she in her heart this terrible wildness out of which came suffering to us also. But now, since you have given me accurate proof describing our bed, which no other mortal man besides has ever seen, only you and I, and there is one serving woman, Actor's daughter, whom my father gave me when I came here, who used to guard the doors for us in our well-built chamber. So you persuade my heart, though it has been very stubborn. 
So she spoke, and still more roused in him the passion for weeping. He wept as he held his lovely wife. Note, note how he suppressed his passions. He's held them in check, but when it's no longer necessary, he is happy to weep openly, and she likewise. The Greeks are not opposed to weeping. They're not opposed to the passions being displayed, but they want them to be under the control until it's appropriate for weeping to take place. So he does this, uh, and he wept as he held his lovely wife, whose thoughts were virtuous. And as he, when, uh, and as when the land, in this epic simile, when the land appears welcome to men who are swimming, after Poseidon has smashed their strong-built ship on the open water, pounding it with the weight of wind in the heavy seas, and only a few escape the gray water landward by swimming with a thick scurf of salt coated over them, and gladly they set foot on the shore, escaping the evil. So welcome was her husband to her as she looked upon him, and she could not let him go from the embrace of her white arms. And stays with him. And then he tells his story to her, etc., of what's taken place before this, etc. Now, uh, what have I got here? I think I'm running out of time. Book 24 is the suitors, families, outraged, coming with their spears and their swords, and they're going to kill Odysseus. And the gods come in and intervene. Enough of this. This is going to stop. We're going we're gonna to end this right now. The gods literally intervene on Odysseus' behalf, protect him, make sure that the injustice ha that has been rectified does not result in the death of the very hero whose fame they were bent upon uh, justifying in the eyes of the world. And the epic ends with the story of Odysseus then leaving, sailing away to plant his or in the ground to satisfy Poseidon so that all the gods are happy. So it all ends happily ever after, with the gods placated, with justice being done, so a full restoration. And what the Greek audience comes away with is that the gods are just and will make sure that justice is done in the end. However long they may delay, how much suffering ensues, the gods are just and will not allow injustice to stand. So again, uh, teaching and wisdom and virtue. And that's how the epic concludes. I'll leave it off with that because I run out of time. Next time.